I've got this derelict Honda snow thrower that was left behind. Now, generally, when things are left behind, it's because they don't work. But I have gotten lucky a few times, and some operational stuff has been kind of gifted to me. So I'm going to try to get this started. If it starts, great. If it doesn't, I'll see what I can do to get it running. There is a little fuel left in here. I'm just going to... I'm not going to dump it out, I'm just going to pour some new fuel in and dilute the old stuff as much as possible. Fuel is on, choke is on, ignition is on. Ah, crap. Now I know why it was abandoned, though. Uh, first step, see if we've got spark. There's a spark plug under this cover, if I can get it off. There it is. There's some good news though, that tan color that's on the insulator of the electrode, that's exactly what you want to see. That means the engine's, well when it was running, was running pretty much perfectly as far as the mixture goes. Just grounding this to the case and pulling the, the starter to see if we get spark. And we do, it probably doesn't, doesn't show up on the uh, camera, but there's definitely spark there. I put a little bit of fuel directly into the cylinder before putting the spark plug back in. I'll go ahead and pull that and see if we can get it to at least fire that way. And sometimes that's all it needs, just kind of like a little jump start. And after that, then it runs and starts fine. So it just burned the gas in the cylinder and quit, and that was it. It wasn't pulling any fuel. I'm going to try it again. Yeah, no dice. It's not pulling any fuel, just burning what's in the cylinder, and that's it. So now I need to check if there's fuel in the carburetor, which I'm assuming is behind this panel right here, in which case there's a few bolts I need to take off. I'm not sure how many they are, but I'm sure they're metric. Yeah, as it turns out, in order to get the, I'm going to call it the dashboard, that black panel where all the, uh, the choke and the fuel control and the kill switch is, I need to take off this top panel as well because it's overlapping it. Of course, you have to disassemble half the thing just to get to one part, right? Well, this is interesting. I've never worked on a Honda before, at least not Honda lawn equipment. And this appears to be a drain plug on the fuel bowl. And uh, I've not seen that on any other engines I've worked on before. So I'm thinking if I can just take that drain plug out I can check to see if there's fuel in the bowl as opposed to having to take the fuel bowl nut off instead and well think again I uh, I can't get a good angle with the screwdriver you can't tell from the camera angle but the frame isn't allowing me to get real good engagement and it's also really tight so I don't think that's gonna come out as is and also, I can't get to the bolt that holds the fuel bowl on there on the bottom. There's not enough room in there. So, I guess I'm going to have to pull this forward a little bit so I can get to that drain plug uh, a little easier. And I understand that even if there is fuel in the carburetor, and maybe it's old and that's why it didn't start but in my experience i've had machines that sat for you know two three four years with fuel in them and they at least tried to start or they burped or maybe they would start and they would run rough plus as many times as i pulled that starter with the choke on it would have flooded i would have smelled something and i didn't so that's why i'm thinking this is a 
a fuel delivery problem, not a, an old fuel problem. And it turns out there is fuel in the fuel bowl. So time to take off the carburetor and take a closer look. Fortunately, this machine has a fuel shutoff valve. Like if you work on a lawnmower, you pull the carb, you got to clamp off the fuel line so that the fuel tank doesn't drain while you don't have anything connected to it. But here, I can just shut the fuel off, which is nice. So I got the carburetor on the bench now and I'm just pulling off the fuel bowl. And despite before bringing it to the bench, turning this in every orientation possible to get all of the fuel out, inevitably there will be some left in there still. You know, like that. It turned out this wasn't in the camera frame, but I was blowing into the fuel line and pushing up on the float valve just to be sure that the needle was seating fully and that it was stopping fuel flow and it seemed to be working correctly. Well this is different. Again this is the first time I've worked on a, a Honda small engine but the metering jet is up inside the carburetor. Everything else I've ever worked on, I think they were probably all Walbro carbs, has the metering jet as part of the bolt that holds the fuel bowl on. And that jet is slotted so it can be removed with a flathead screwdriver. It was a little tight but I did finally get it to break loose. It took a little finagling to get this thing out though but when I finally did and I held it up to the light and I could not see any light coming through whatsoever. The orifice in these jets is quite small so it doesn't take much to clog it up. Any little piece of debris that gets into the fuel tank can do that. Or corrosion in the carb too that can break off like zinc oxide or aluminum oxide can clog that up too. I clean up the whole carb with plenty of carbon choke cleaner. And same with the jet, I clean that out with a carb cleaner and uh, with the help of a solid strand wire to poke through and clear out any obstruction. There are plenty of pitas when working on a small engine, and this is one of them. The float valve needle needs to go into the float valve bore like this. However, you can't assemble it in this order because then the float itself can't engage the needle. You need to put the needle into the float first, and then while that's kind of dangling there, assemble it, being able to get the needle down into the bore without it falling out. This one wasn't too bad actually, and, and most float carbs aren't that difficult. It's the, uh, the diaphragm pump type carbs that like you'd have on a chainsaw or a weed whipper. Uh, there's a rocker arm on that needle, and those are the ones that will really get the curse words flying. Uh, checking to be sure that that gasket is intact and then putting the fuel bowl on, making sure that that drain plug will be facing towards the back of the machine once the carburetor is on. The uh, carburetor is back in. Before I bolt that down, the air cleaner has to go on first, and that's the air cleaner there. It's basically just like a coarse mesh and uh, it'll stop boulders from getting in the engine, but that's about it. I turned the gas valve on for about a minute, minute and a half previous to this, just to be sure the fuel bowl had time to fill up. And now is the moment of truth. Nice. And then, but I still need to test it though. 
I took this to an alternate location where I have a concrete driveway, not gravel driveway, which is where I'm going to use it ultimately anyway. I know I'm pushing my luck here, risking not throwing a rock through a windshield of a car here, but uh, uh, ultimately though, I was unimpressed with how well it threw snow. The engine was running fine, but it didn't seem like it was moving all the snow, and what snow it was moving, it wasn't throwing it very far. For the low discharge velocity issue, I thought possibly the auger was slipping. The auger is belt driven and there's a pulley on the auger, a pulley on the motor and it's loose enough to where it slips until you pull in this lever. That pushes an idler wheel up into the belt that essentially tightens it and then it stops slipping. If the cable is out of adjustment, the idler wheel won't apply enough force to the belt and it'll still slip to a degree. In this case though, it was adjusted correctly so that's not the problem. So I took a look at the auger assembly, the paddles specifically. Now these paddles are nylon reinforced rubber, so they're flexible, but they do wear down. The paddles on the side, these uh, corkscrew shaped paddles, those are the ones that move the snow towards the inside. And then it's the, uh, the middle paddles are the ones that actually throw the snow. So the snow gets pushed up into this volute, or you might call it the housing, and then up to the discharge, and then there it goes. As these paddles wear down, you end up with an increasingly larger gap between the housing, or the volute, and the paddle. And just like in a pump, as a pump wears down, you lose pressure and you lose velocity. And this is essentially a, a pump. It's a snow pump. And uh, if those paddles are worn and we have too much gap, we're going to lose velocity. And this down here is a scraper bar, and that essentially uh, gets the stuff that these rubber paddles aren't going to pick up, the stuff that's real packed down. And that's a wear item also, and this one feels pretty rough actually. I bought a new set of paddles, but I didn't change them yet because I wanted to wait until the next snowfall so that I could do a before and after test with the same snow conditions. So this here is with the old paddles and it's doing better than before because this is lighter snow but it's still not throwing it really that far. So then I went and changed over to the new paddles and a new scraper bar as well. Unfortunately I didn't have as much space in the new location as my old one so my workspace was a little cramped. Changing the center paddles was pretty easy because the plates that sandwich the paddle itself are removable. However, not so easy for the side paddles. That uh, helix structure there doesn't separate, so you need to put those paddles down into a groove and uh, WD-40 or your uh, dish soap or something like that to lubricate it is a must. Otherwise, it's impossible to get those to seat all the way down into that groove. Here's the first pass with the new paddles installed and uh, the difference is, is amazing actually. It looks like it's throwing the snow probably twice as far as it was before. And I was real happy to see that. As a matter of fact, it made more of a difference than I thought it would. So my free snowblower turned into a $42 snowblower, but that's still practically free in terms of how much it costs to buy a snowblower. 